If you could just uh, grab a seat, we're going to get started. We had a few more presentations come in at the last minute. And if you don't know, uh, I'm Doug Miller. I host the, the forum with the Matsu Burrow. Um, and we're just trying to fill seats a little bit up front just because we're live streaming. So all 10 viewers out there in, on the web are watching the forum right now. Um, and that's a technology that we're actually testing out. We're going to present on that at 930 today. Um, Okay, good. That's why everything's at a bit of an angle as well. We have a camera, just so you're aware, that's a camera over here, and Mike Jamaleski with Radio Free Palmer is kind of helping us out with the tech today. Um, and so he'll be actually showing the room here as well as the screen. Um, if you guys want to know about public Wi-Fi and tap into the WebEx, we're also on WebEx today. So people on WebEx are seeing the presentation as you see on the screen. Um, and then we have the public Wi-Fi and the password there, MSB public, if you haven't tapped into that before. Um, what we quickly try to do is we have a kind of a packed 30 minutes or 25 minutes before our first presentation at 9 o'clock. So what we often do is do a quick round of introductions. Um, then we'll have a brief update on our state geo portal uh, with Jack and then uh, a little bit about training and today's theme of the topics today from Eric Wyatt, IT Director, Matsu Burrow. So real quickly, Doug Miller, I'm with Wasman and Associates, been working with the Burrow a couple of years on the Smart Communities Forum. And um, I think we'll just go ahead and I won't pass the speaker around. Kenny? So this is Kenny Kleewine with the Matsu Burrow. Jack Warner, Matsu Burrow. Thanks, everybody. And then, so real quickly, we're just going to get into a couple of brief updates with Jack on the Geo Portal. And Morning. So, um, among other things, we have a bunch of uh, working groups, um, and I'm the co-chair for the uh, Portals and Data Working Group. Um, the other co-chair is um, Ann Johnson. Um, we are actually a uh, a joint working group between the Alaska Smart Communities Forum, this group, and the Alaska Geospatial Council, uh, which is mostly headed by DNR. Um, anyway, um, among the biggest news we've got is that um, after long last, we actually have our own self-hosted portal. Um, I'll, we have uh, addresses at, 
available later, but uh, here it is. As you can see, it's uh, still a work in progress. Um, but uh, once we get it populated, um, it should be uh, helping us uh, show off some of the uh, maps and apps that, the, uh, uh, that uh, are available throughout the state. Now, the idea behind this is this is a portal of portals. Um, the idea that we can show off um, uh, maps, apps, and data that uh, are made by a variety of groups around the, the state, not just any one. Uh, now, this does not alleviate the uh, system that we had before, which uh, the open data portal, which thought I had that up. Um, so, um, which is specifically data, which is what you would need for um, actually uh, creating apps yourself. Um, this is where you would pull in base maps or uh, data streams, that sort of thing. Uh, similar technologies, but one is self-hosted by the organization and the other is um, in the cloud with Esri. Uh, this is something that um, while they're actually both using the same software, uh, one is available on the cloud, the other is not. Or I should say, one is available for all implementations, the other is not. Um, this has been done, uh, or most of the work here was done by uh, Kenny Wood, uh, who is under the state geologist at DNR. Um, other things that we've got is um, Aaron Palmer, uh, is working on a script to kind of clean up the metadata and allow for um, mass updates. And then um, uh, that's from the DNR side and Kenny Kleewine is uh, working on that uh, from our side. Um, the address, uh, the quick addresses, um, I'll mention them, but uh, uh, as I said, we'll have them available on slides later. Uh, the geo portal, um, is just geoportal.alaska.gov. And then the other one has a longer address, but uh, you can get to it by going to matsugov.us slash geoportal slash data. And uh, that's about it. Yeah, good. So again, I'm uh, Eric Wyatt at the Matsu Borough, uh, my T director. So the reason uh, that we are having this uh, geo portal or data portals is uh, this is information that, uh, you know, we as government agencies are collecting, but we're collecting on the taxpayer dime. This information belongs to all of us. And so we want to uh, have a way to get to it very quickly and easily so that the, the people who are entrepreneurs and decision makers can get to this data quickly and they can use it to do great things for our community. So this is kind of a, um, a central theme to what we're talking about here today as uh, smart communities. Is that, uh, that covers everything that, do you wanna, okay? Um, well, um, hopefully we can get these scripts working. We've got a couple meetings, uh, both with, um, the portal working group and its uh, its uh, parent working groups, um, but uh, hadn't really prepped that. So, yeah. sorry. So we've been trying to get the app set up and the platform set up. Can you talk about it for the first year? Absolutely. So one of the things we've been talking about at these uh, smart community meetings, these forum meetings, is, is partnering with multiple agencies. Um, and that, this has been a great success there. So the, the borough and the DNR have been uh, partnering to stand up these portals and get this data out. So uh, big, uh, big congratulations to the group that has been doing that. Thank you very much. Actually, I'm with the world's greatest exemplar of what the French call stairway wit. Um, so, you know, once I get out the out the door out the door and halfway down the stairwell I was like oh yeah that's what I was gonna say uh, so what we've got in the next 90 days actually is uh, we've been uh, working a lot with uh, GIS data um, mapping type stuff but one of the other things that we are uh, work working on is actually enabling uh, non geolocation data um, and so we I've actually got um, uh, contacts with uh, state finance and um, elections 
Uh, and then we actually also have some uh, non-geolocated data at the borough that we want to get in there as well. So that's another big step for. Thank you, Jack. Good. So uh, uh, next, what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to kind of queue up a little bit here, kind of the theme of uh, today's Smart Community Forum, and uh, we're going to be talking about uh, training here a little bit. My intro slide, you can see, is uh, is a view of our open data portal here at the Matsu Borough. Actually, the slide I used at our last assembly briefing. And you recognize the little picture over there in the corner? That was our, our first Alaska uh, Smart Community Forum meeting up at Government Peaks. So anybody here that had attended that one? I see quite a few people that attended that one. So but, uh, what is this now, number nine we're, we're on? So, um, OK, so to queue up today's uh, topics, um, a quote from surveys of CEOs saying one of our top obstacles uh, to our organizations is talent. And so, you know, as we're talking about uh, all this new technology and smart communities, one of the things that has to follow is a bunch of smart people. And that means we have to continuously be um, training our, our personnel. Okay? I'm going to tell you a little story about uh, why training is important. This was me as a kid. I was out in the woods cutting um, firewood for the family at a home to heat, heat our home. I got my crosscut saw out there working away. Dad comes along and he says, hey, I got this new thing. It's called a chainsaw. He says, why don't you try that? So he gives me the chainsaw, and I'm out there working away with the chainsaw. He comes back after a little while. He says, how's it going? And I said, it's horrible. I can't cut as much uh, with this as I could with my crosscut. Give me my crosscut back. And, and then he starts it. So new technology is great, but um, until you learn how to use it, it's really useless. And so training is, is vitally important. And of course, once he trained me, there, there I was. That's, again, me as a child, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> OK, so, uh, so that's why uh, we're talking today about, uh, you know, we're going to deliver a lot of new uh, technology, but unless, not, not just the IT departments, but unless all of the organization knows how to use those tools, it's uh, kind of useless. So we need to talk about the digitization of the workplace and then transforming our talent base so that they can use that. We've got a lot of things coming, a lot of new terms, Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, blockchain. What do they mean? How do you use them? Uh, in the uh, Matsu borough, the IT department uh, has put together a strategic plan, and one of our goals within our strategic plan is to provide tools and training to elevate the maturity of our organization. So uh, that's what we're all about around here. There are challenges to this, obviously, to all of us. We all face these. We never have enough money. That's the first thing. When we start having tight budgets, oftentimes training is one of the first things to go, but we simply can't afford that. We have to continue to uh, train our people. Time, uh, learning styles. Some people learn in classrooms and with uh, personal interactions. Some people do well with books or online. Everybody does things a little different, so we have to deliver training in a variety of ways. Um, we in Alaska sometimes have a difficulty because this training isn't available up here. It's not as readily available, so we have to bring trainers up, which usually means more money. Uh, timing of our training, if we provide the training too soon, we forget. If we provide it too late, uh, people might start using the tools and develop bad habits. I'll go back to the chainsaw, out there with the chainsaw doing this. That was my bad habit. So, uh, and then uh, location and sustainment of the training. Uh, one of the things that we are working on at the borough right now is upgrading one of our platforms. And one of the lessons learned is we didn't have sustainment training after the system was installed. So over time, we've kind of lost uh, the knowledge of how to use that system. And as we upgrade it, we're going to improve that. So I wanted to talk about a few of uh, the current efforts. Um, uh, as we have talked about uh, our partnership with the Matsu Borough and the DNR, one of the other things that we did is we uh, put on some ESRI training for ArcGIS here at the borough. We couldn't fill all the seats, so we invited DNR to come up and, and join us. And then when they put on some other training, we went down and joined them. So that allows us to combine our resources between two separate agencies and get um, the training that we need. <clears throat> In the uh, borough, 
We've set up a new training room in the basement of this building, providing additional training. Uh, I talked a little bit about the uh, project that we're working on. It's a system called Govern. One of the lessons learned is we didn't do proper training at the beginning. We didn't have sustainment training. So we're going to learn that lesson and we're going to continue on. Um, a lot of other training efforts that have been going on around the community, and I want to uh, point one out in particular. The UA Matsu, uh, we met Dr. Harry Banks here just a, a moment ago, has a, a computer systems technology department out there. He has put together an advisory council, and on that advisory council, he asks the community, what kind of skills do we need to sustain our workforce going forward? And so uh, we sit down and we talk about this is what we need and organizations like the borough or other uh, uh, commercial organizations and we let him know this is what we see on the horizon so he makes sure that he's got the classes that are are doing those kinds of things um, smart community today we're going to talk about uh, um uaa lms so adam's going to talk to us about that um, jim's going to talk to us about uh, big and and developing our talent and what uh, commercial options are available for training and the, the geomatics uh, group is here as well today to uh, talk about what we've got available for training in that area. As an offshoot of this uh, particular group, uh, we had an opportunity where we can take some of these tools that the borough is providing and uh, show them to some of the local commercial companies. And so, um, Steve Colgan, thank you for bringing the group in uh, last week, and he brought the home builders in and, and had us show them some of the new data and how to get to it, like Jack just described, and some of the new tools that the GIS team has been um, putting out, show, uh, show that group of people how to use those tools so that they can do their work more effectively. So that's been an offshoot of, of this group, and I think a uh, great success. Okay, so that's what I've got for an intro, and any questions before I turn it back to Doug? So in this a uh, couple more minutes, and we'll have Adam who come up here in a, in a couple minutes. We have, uh, for those of you, who is, who is new to the forum? Who, what's our first time being at a forum? Okay, yep, so we've got at least 10 or 12 folks. Um, and so I wanted to say is we have a website that's set up for all the documentation, the presentations, and, and links and so forth that we've covered in prior meetings. So there's been a, a bit of a storyline. We actually had a demonstration um, in January that showed how to use the, um, the platform that Jack was just kind of showing um, as far as building your own maps with your own, uh, in that case, an ArcGIS online um, free account. So it, it takes a little bit of time to kind of get accustomed to how these, uh, how you might use it yourselves, but as well as DNR, um, uh, Muni Anchorage, uh, Matsu Burrow, they all have their platforms and the other uh, departments have their own platforms uh, that are already pre-staged with apps of, of all kinds of variety. So um, if you've not seen it in the last two years, all of those platforms have come really far along in terms of the applications uh, that are really, um, that have hosted data of a particular nature and you can click through and there's plenty of storyboards as well, particularly from Matsu Bureau that I've seen. Um, the last couple of months. The forum, this, these are this, uh, the success factors for the forum. It got set up two, two years ago. And so really what's the, a lot of the tenets are livability in the community, economic growth, more transparent and efficient government. The cameras today are a little bit more about that transparency. Um, more engaged citizenry as well as more informed decisions. Um, trying to get more information. This is what Eric has talked about the last couple of years. I got all this information, how do I get out there? So these are just different avenues to get that, that information out there. Same thing for Anchorage. If you don't know, they have a, they have a, a, a great geo uh, platform as well as a, a open data platform. Um, they're usually hosted separately. So that's why Jack was talking about we have geospatial based information oftentimes uh, through a provider, oftentimes a technology, say Esri. Um, and then they also have the open data that could be on any number of platforms, but it, sometimes it is, it's uh, more graphical pie chart related data without a spatial component. 
um, but they're constantly kind of, so there, there are two different things, but they're, they're, uh, uh, they're very meaningful in terms of uh, learning more about your community. For example, in Anchorage, you'll have information about maybe crime stats, um, uh, as well as, I think one, was, one of the first ones they did was restaurant health inspections back the last 20 years. So if you really want to zero in on that, they actually have a geographic element to that as well. And you can kind of see the statistics. So anyway, just be aware. Um, so on the forum success, obviously, we've had, this is our ninth forum. Uh, we usually have about 50 folks that are attending, 150 people that are invited to attend. Um, always looking to have more folks to attend and, and contribute their thoughts. It's about exchanging inf information and knowledge about new uh, techniques or adding your data. I talked to an organization that might actually want to contribute their data through their conservation group to the Matsu Borough, and that's something that could be theoretically displayed through the Matsu Borough uh, GIS uh, platform. That's what this one example. But it's data collected by an organization outside the Matsu Borough. Same thing the, the Anchorage uh, group does. Um, there is a trails committee, uh, trails uh, group that does trails grooming, for example, on uh, ski trails in Anchorage. It's all done uh, by a volunteer organization, but they provide that data feed and data information regularly, I, I believe daily, to the, the city of Anchorage through a portal. And so Anchorage is able to display that information to everyone but it's collected not by the city, but by a volunteer organization. And that, that takes a little bit of nurturing. They have a GIS point person, an open data point person at the city of Anchorage, just like they do here. But anyway, those are the opportunities. And I see a lot of companies or agencies here. Great to see the troopers here today. Um, or at least, the, sorry, I'm going to say fishing game, right? All right. So is I, just, I just went, nope, he's green. So we have green here today. But actually, it's one of the first... Um, you know, public safety presences that we've had at the forum before. And we've not had uh, EMS or fire yet, but those are oftentimes some of the, the, the biggest drivers for some of the information that they display. We saw that in Rancho Cucamonga and other organizations that we've had present in the past two years. It's, it's usually crime statistics um, uh, or other information that either police or fire want to get displayed out to the community, okay? Um, but anyway, that's just a, a little bit more about the roundabout information about the platforms. But are the forums successful? Are we getting knowledge? Are we having opportunities identified that are sharing information? We've talked about partnering agreements um, with Matsu Borough and the city of Palmer. Still in the works. A little bit closer. Well, it, and a little bit closer, we have, Eric's got to drive a lot of things here. Um, but at the same time, too, it's going through some legal work and so forth. But Nate from the city of Palmer is the contact. I'm working with the city of Wasilla to perhaps have them engage here on a partnership like an MOU for the, so they can contribute their data for their community to the, the borough-wide platform here at Matsu. Okay, so some of those things are still going on. And then, um, yeah, and that's just how well are we doing as a forum coming together. So far, we're still having some success with these. And by the show of the group here, that's great to see the, that you're here. And we're always open to having comments and feedback about other content. I've already got half the agenda for August already kind of filled up with ideas. And welcome all the ideas that are coming. Um, real quick today, and we're going to jump into 9 o'clock, is the Matsu Borough has hosted this uh, forum for the past two years, My Time, Food, and so forth. Uh, today is our first time that we have uh, another sponsor, that's MTA that's uh, helped sponsor the, uh, the food today. So that's uh, not a small cost, so we definitely appreciate that, and we actually invite anybody else who'd like to help sponsor um, part of the events going forward. That's how we make it sustainable. At 10 o'clock today, you're gonna hear a gentleman, uh, CEO of Vizius, who set up a, a forum somewhat like this four years ago in Austin, Austin City, UP. Um, you'll hear a lot more about uh, what they're doing. They've made it a sustainable model, much like a ro rotary uh, organization, right? So it's small membership fees that help pay for re regular meetings that they have monthly or even more often. Um, but he'll talk a little bit more about how they're able to make, sus make it sustainable. And it hasn't been a slow pro uh, progression for them there in Austin as well. And among, if you haven't Googled Austin City before, it's, there's quite a number of tech uh, organizations, uh, not just the Austin City UP. So, but I thought it was an interesting example that we got referred to to look at 
that might be for this organization. So enough of that. Um, what we'd like to have today is um, a little bit of presentation about the learning management system that they have at UAA and how, how extensible that has been for several years at UAA to have remote training and education. So with that, Adam. Hi, everybody. Uh, Adam Pollack, uh, UAA CIO. Uh, thanks, Doug, for, uh, for having us here uh, this morning. So show of hands, uh, how many of you have used an LMS as a student in a degree-seeking program? Okay. Got a few? Okay. So something for you all to consider, you know, as hiring managers or, uh, uh, you know, those who are training uh, folks in your organizations, uh, probably the majority of the folks that are coming in who've been uh, through a degree-seeking program and have earned their degree, uh, if they've you know, been in college in the last you know, 10 years, they are probably used an LMS. And they're probably uh, very used to how they operate. Uh, and uh, you know, in many cases, I'll, I'll show you some uh, um, information about satisfaction among students in LMSs. Uh, they they uh, you know, enjoy the use of it. They find value in it. So just a note uh, on that. And uh, so the title here, uh, Doug came up with a great title. Uh, you know, the kind of the bottom part there, I hope I can live up to it. Very fancy. So what's the primary purpose, uh, purpose of an LMS? The very basic uh, level, it's a repository. So it's a collection of information. Uh, you know, think of you know, syllabus, um, learning uh, materials for the course. Uh, it's a place where a student uh, can go to find the core information about their, their class, uh, what's coming up, uh, what, they, what do they have to uh, um, you know, do next in the course. Uh, gives them some visibility into uh, um, uh, their course and how they can participate in it. But it's way beyond that now. So LMSs uh, really came into uh, their uh, wide use in the early to mid 2000s. Uh, most, I, I think pretty much all uh, colleges now use them in one, one form or another. It doesn't necessarily mean that all the instructors use the LMS within that, that college, but most colleges offer it now. But typically an LMS is purpose built uh, to, to ensure learning outcomes. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But there's, you know, uh, professors like to study themselves, uh, and there's a lot of study in how they uh, are effective with LMSs. Uh, there, a lot of research has gone into uh, ensuring that they produce the learning outcomes that are desired. And there's a lot of work that, uh, you know, goes into a course ahead of time uh, by an instructor to ensure that those learning outcomes can be met. So, you know, another, I mean, this seems obvious, but an LMS has a course focus. So uh, imagine, you know, for those of you who uh, maybe didn't uh, have an LMS when you attended college uh, a while back, wh where was the course focus? Uh, it was really around an instructor. So if you needed in more information about a course or where it was going, you had to talk to that person about it. There typically, you know, weren't any materials beyond, you know, a syllabus or, you know, the book that you have or, you know, maybe another handout. But you, you didn't necessarily get to see where the course was going. You couldn't access your instructor 24-7. I mean, that you had office hours or you saw that instructor in class. So really it was around the instructor as the focus or the class itself when you were in class. There wasn't this other component that, that made up your course and created a focus around that course that was available all the time. And that's what students have now and that's what they expect. And of course, LMSs are built to run real friendly on mobile. Uh, that's typically a, you know, a way that uh, students will uh, access their LMS. Uh, we, have, we have students often will access the LMS while they're in class you know, on a mobile device. Another key component here is that the instructor has a lot of control over uh, what goes to the course. So some instructors may say, you know what, I'm gonna show you all of it ahead of time so you have a good idea of, of uh, what's coming up and where we're going. Others instructors may decide to only show uh, 
what's uh, you know, what should go out to the students as the students are learning. So not to overwhelm a student, but to ensure that outcomes are met. You know, the, uh, many instructors will have a kind of a checkpoint, ensure that, you know, by this time, you know, at this period, uh, you know, uh, so class starts in the fall, you know, by September, we should be at this point uh, and ensure you need to intervene. And that, that's a big thing for us right now at uh, UAA is using the information that we have in our various systems to predict uh, when a student might be at risk and engaging with them uh, before they end up getting a, a D or an F or withdrawal. Of course, this is a great one for, uh, uh, for uh, your you know, professors out there is allowing a, a one place, a one stop shop for assignment submission. So uh, whether it's a paper or a presentation or uh, uh, you know, it could be a video, really could be in any format, as long as it's electronic, uh, submitting through the LMS, and then again, then that connects into the grade book. It's easier for them to review and grade. It's easy for them to push it back out to a course to show, a, uh, you know, to all students in a course to show an example of, hey, this is, uh, this is the, the finest example that I saw of this. Uh, this is what an A looks like, or, you know, learn from this one because uh, this uh, really meets the mark. But it uh, really allows quick sharing, and uh, you know, hopefully, uh, it, it helps with those learning outcomes uh, very rapidly. Any questions so far about uh, LMS? What it is, what it does, why it's important? Again, why this might be important to you is if you're hiring folks who've been uh, in the college, you know, in the last 10 years or so. This is how they they learn. This is central to their learning. So how do we use it at UAA? So about 55% of our instructors uh, use it regularly. Seems like kind of a low number, but there are many courses where it, it doesn't necessarily lend itself uh, you know, well. Uh, an outdoors course or a music course. Uh, there are some that uh, you know, just uh, the instructors you know, don't, don't find LMSs as useful. And we've used it for, of course, traditional classes. So, you know, the, what you would imagine, you know, accounting 101, et cetera. Uh, you know, a, a student coming into UAA and conducting a class. We also use it for uh, online courses. It's very handy, and I'll show you a screenshot here uh, that shows a built-in uh, uh, web conferencing tool. It's called Collaborate that we use uh, with Blackboard. Then we're also, uh, we also use Blackboard uh, at UAA for professional development. So we have uh, groups that uh, simply want to, you know, uh, one is an Arctic engineering course where, uh, you know, for in order for a professional engineer to maintain their license in the state, they need to uh, attend this uh, Arctic engineering course, especially if they came from out of state, they come, come into state with a, a license that they, you know, they had, you know, license in Missouri. Of course, Missouri probably isn't requiring an Arctic engineering course. Uh, they come to Alaska and they find that they need it. UAA can teach it because we have great instructors. Uh, we have professors who know it very well. Uh, but we use Blackboard for, for that kind of development as well. We also find that uh, we had a, a use case recently where um, uh, we've got a, a group that wants to teach uh, uh, real estate agents uh, some uh, professional development. And this would be a, not a traditional course, but one where all the materials go up on Blackboard and that person's got six months to run through the materials, take the test, and then you know, take a final test for, those, uh, for that credit. So it's also, and that's you know, more of a use of, uh, of uh, an LMS in a more of a repository uh, uh, situation where someone can come in and access the materials you know, really 24 seven as they have the time uh, to get done what they need to get done. Here's some stats. Uh, this is from the, the University of Buffalo, uh, did a nationwide uh, study. And uh, you can see here, uh, post a syllabus, kind of the very basic uh, you know, use of an LMS, but that's the most popular. Uh, I, I did mention the, the grade book, uh, pushing in uh, or pushing out uh, and collecting assignments. Uh, the, the, la or the, the third, but from the bottom, uh, third and second. So teach completely online courses and uh, teach partially online courses. So that obviously is a, a real big push right now. We've got ads, you've probably heard them from Arizona State, uh, you know, on public radio and, and others. Uh, we've got folks coming into really our territory here uh, ready to sell online courses. 
Uh, meanwhile, we've got folks uh, out in villages. We've got uh, you know very uh, uh, you know, ge geographically diverse state. We've got a need to uh, you know help uh, students in uh, far-flung locations um, learn, and often it's through video conferencing or it's through uh, online. And that's something that uh, we're uh, you know, spending a lot of time uh, internally at UAA, ensuring that we've got uh, you know, the right tools in place and we've got effective methods for uh, reaching those folks, especially those in uh, um, locations with uh, underwhelming bandwidth. So I mentioned the satisfaction. So uh, what do instructors, again, this is University of Buffalo, 92% uh, faculty are uh, satisfied with, with the basic uh, use and function of an LMS. There's some other good stats here. Yeah, I would, I would note, so we're talking about training today, right? So even the instructors, 25% of them said, I'm a little frustrated with uh, the training that you gave me on my training tool. And some of that is uh, simply it's, uh, you know, for someone who hasn't used it before, uh, it's, it is a new concept. And it, they do get quite intricate in the functions that, uh, that are available to an instructor, down to you know, being able to time when their materials are available, being able to set up uh, recurring reminders uh, through email. Uh, there, there's a lot that can be done here. So what do the students think? 85% used an LMS in their learning. 93% are satisfied with uh, what an LMS brings to the table for them. So again, uh, this is what your new employees may expect. When you say training, they may be thinking Blackboard or an LMS. Uh, they may be thinking about those functions that were easily available to them 24-7. It is interesting here, though, that uh, only 56% said they really want faculty to be using it uh, um, actively. So I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what the disconnect there is uh, between the 93% satisfaction and only 56% then wanting them to, to use it. Maybe it's uh, they're being held to a higher standard uh, through Blackboard. I'm not sure. Who's out there uh, in the market? So of course, uh, the big red, red one here is uh, uh, Blackboard Learn. Uh, again, that's what uh, we use at UA. Uh, so all three campuses and uh, all the community campuses are on Blackboard. But there are others here. Uh, there are several that are uh, Moodle, for example, and some others that are open source. So uh, you know, if you found that uh, there might be some value in an LMS in your organization, uh, there are, uh, you know, quote, free uh, versions available. Of course, it's all in the configuration and setup. There's, there's a lot to do there. We have, you know, at, at UAA uh, in the UA system, uh, we, we have a lot of automation in place, so uh, uh, from our ERP, uh, all the courses are set, all the student enrollments are set, uh, and we bring all of that data down to populate uh, Blackboard. We have that uh, occur on an hourly basis. We have one big load at the beginning of the semester, and then it continues to uh, update you know, the students coming in, withdrawing, uh, changing their classes uh, before uh, the add withdrawal deadline. Okay, what does an LMS look like? So this first page here shows what uh, an instructor sees. So, uh, you know, allowing them to uh, get in and, uh, you know, edit their content, uh, what activity is occurring, you know, along the way. Uh, it gives them a summary. See over here, uh, there's a, a grade center, which I mentioned. Uh, they can see who their students are. Uh, there's a lot of customization available for uh, for an instructor to set things up exactly like they like. Uh, so uh, you know we find that uh, you know some instructors are are more you know uh, I guess accepting and you know get into it more than others, uh, and and those are uh, um, it's fun to work with those folks who really want to get the most out of uh, their LMS. But this is kind of their their dashboard, and it allows uh, that control of their course. Here's an example of a test, pretty much what you'd expect. Multiple choice, uh, and again, you know, it's not so much, it, well, it, it's not so much, you know, the, the fact that uh, we're, we're taking a test online, but it's the integration and allowing a, an instructor, you know, through a, a dashboard to see immediately, you know, automatically have it be graded, 
and see immediately how uh, their, their students are doing and uh, notice any trouble spots. Kind of a long way from the days of Scantron. I mentioned uh, video conference. So built right in to, uh, to our version of Blackboard is a, a video conference uh, component. And this allows uh, an instructor to uh, bring it, so they can post a link automatically into their course, so an instructor, a student goes in and, and finds the link. It allows them to, uh, just as you would imagine, you know, like a Skype for Business or a, a Zoom, uh, it shows all the, the students there, but it allows a little bit uh, additional functionality that are, is specific to uh, a learning uh, organization, it allows students to raise hands, uh, it allows the instructor to uh, break out uh, their their folks into or their students into groups. Uh, it allows a you know a pretty standard functionality like a, a chat function or a discussion board to go on. It also gives the instructor the ability to turn those functions on and off as they're needed uh, within a class. Of course, uh, you know posting uh, content uh, for display uh, within the, the course. And here's an example of a, a plugin. So I mentioned that there are many vendors out there, hundreds, who have uh, plugins purpose-built for Blackboard. Uh, here's one where uh, it's called Who Knew It? it used to be called Atomic Learning, and it uh, this uh, plugin allows easy access to training courses that they've developed on uh, you know some basic um, basic functionality that you know instructor may not go into detail. And so like Excel or Word. Uh, uh, you know, office tools. Uh, there, there, are, there are many others. It, it's got, uh, you know, really hundreds of, uh, of training courses that are available. They're usually pretty short, 15 minutes, 20 minutes or so. Uh, but it's an, an additional resource that's easy for a student to access. And it's easy for an instructor to recommend and post and make it available. That's it for LMSs. Questions? Yes, Joe. It's a great question. How do we train them? So uh, there is a group uh, uh, within UAA. It's a, a group of instructional designers. And all they do is this stuff. So they learn the, the newest and latest technologies. Uh, and then they teach instructors on how to build courses. So they'll sit down with a uh, with an instructor, ask them what their what their desire is, uh, you know, and offer suggestions. It's kind of like you know what we do with a you know uh, in developing a system, systems analyst. You know, you, you sit down, try to figure out the requirements, uh, and you work with them. You show them new things that they could do, help brainstorm ideas, and then they develop it together. And then often, what you have now is an independent instructor who can you know go off and do their own thing. Uh, of course, this is continually evolving, so we, uh, you know, constantly have new features and functions available to us, uh, and uh, uh, you know, it's a constant learning process. So those who are teachers are constantly learning as well. Harry, Joe. Other questions? Yes. Cost. Uh, yes. Uh, not cheap. <laughs> so, yeah, we, uh, uh, Blackboard is proud of their product. Uh, we pay for the system about a quarter million a year. That's just for licensing. And then probably another two to three FTE to keep it running. So it's not cheap, but the value uh, is clearly there. I think so. I, I'd be open to uh, you know exploring uh, partnerships. I mean, we do have licensing considerations. You know, so it depends on what we'd want to do. Uh, we could also offer support in uh, you know the evaluation of tools, or uh, you know we've got a lot of deep experience uh, in that, or even just uh, you know one of the things I wanted to uh, uh, I guess describe today is what your new employees or uh, employees who have been. Uh, uh, maybe to college recently might expect from you from a training perspective. And then also, you know, at its most basic function, 
it's about a repository, and, and you can build a repository a lot of different ways. Uh, but uh, you know, Blackboard may have more functionality than, uh, yeah, it depends on what you want to do with it. It may have more functionality than uh, you know, what a government agency might want. Uh, but we'd, yeah, we'd love to explore that. Yeah, Doug. This is one shared system for the UA system. Yeah, all of UA uses the same system. Hosted in Fairbanks. Except for, you know, again, there are a lot of plugins that are hosted all over the place. So we have a, a, a plugin, say, for uh, ePortfolio, uh, is called, uh, the, the system we use is Digication. That's a cloud service. Who knew it that I showed you earlier? Cloud service, Collaborate, the video conferencing service is cloud. So a lot of these components that are plugged in are cloud. Uh, within UA, so yeah, so for the the real estate example or the Arctic engineering course, those are all within UA. So uh, uh, you know those, yeah, uh, basically. Absolutely. And, you know, there has been uh, talk at times about wouldn't it be great if the, the entire state got on it? Because, uh, you know, this isn't just uh, at the university level, but uh, K through 12 uses, uh, you know, similar functionality. Uh, so, uh, you know, w some states have done it, uh, you know, one license for the entire state uh, to, uh, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, share and reduce costs. So, and Blackboard's... Uh, They've de been developing a cloud service. Uh, it, we, we tested it about two years ago, and it wasn't ready for prime time, but they've invested a lot into it because that's simply where all, all you know, the big vendors are going. So uh, you know, there, there are many possibilities there, and they continue to, it continues to evolve and become more relevant. Other questions? And I, I will, uh, I guess, just close with uh, the, the importance of the LMS system uh, for UAA was... Uh, highlighted uh, probably eight years ago when it went down for a week. So we lost it for a week, and it was clear uh, how uh, important that system was to us. Um, yeah, it was, uh, you know, the old uh, CIO stands for career is over. I'm glad I wasn't the CIO at that point, because uh, there, uh, uh, yeah, it was touch and go there for a while. And of course, it goes back to infrastructure. It was a, uh, an issue with the backups. They you know, the system went down, they restored it to about 90%, found that there was a corrupt sector, had to re-restore again, you know, three-day restore. Uh, it wasn't pretty, but uh, uh, everyone at uh, UAA realized how important that system was to uh, the conduct of our business. It's just, it's in the middle of everything these days. We can't teach without it almost. Thanks, everyone. This on the projector. Yep. 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 And bring it over. Okay. Perfect. We're, we're all set. That's right. My first time on TV. All right. So this is uh, Mike Chmielewski with uh, Radio Free Palmer, and uh, he's going to share a little bit about just a few minutes about what uh, we're doing, uh, streaming this this forum for our first time today and what all goes along with it, so. Thank you. How many of you have been in meetings other than this one? Maybe smaller, more intimate meetings. A dozen people, maybe lasting an hour, maybe lasting a longer time. And through that process, have you reflected after the meeting um, what happened? Yeah. I've practiced taking some notes, <clears throat> some, but it's sometimes difficult to capture what really happened at a meeting. Radio Free Palmer has been working with uh, the borough, the school district, and also with uh, the city of Palmer. And uh, doing that, we, we wander around to conferences, and what we found was that there are organizations that have been working on this question of how to provide two things 
transparency, and a record of what's happening at a meeting. So we approached the city of the station, which already streams the audio and records the audio. We do the same thing for borough assembly meetings. We find that that has worked. People can listen afterwards, during, etc. But it still didn't quite give the same ease of use to find out what really happened there. So uh, we found a, a 501c3 organization, Open Media, uh, headquartered in Denver, Colorado. And we looked at their product, which was a software product. Now over on the side there, on that stand, is a large tube. 80% uh, of that tube is battery. The top portion is actually the camera, which does a number of things. Uh, and I'll demonstrate that in a moment. It shows what's happening here. It can store on a card a record of this, but it also streams live to the platform of your choice, in this case, uh, YouTube. Now, when it does that, it also stores the video up there with no cost. So we approached the city of Palmer and said, OK, do we have a deal for you? Since we're already there streaming audio, what if we place this camera unobtrusively on the side and we were to stream live your meetings and store them not on your platform but elsewhere? And so there's no real cost to you. You just have to provide us with enough bandwidth, which is not really a lot, in order to send that up there. And they, they agreed and agreed to the point where they uh, contributed us an amount of money to uh, lease the software that Open Media provides. So we have two components, software component always sitting in the background and this. But the really interesting thing I'm going to uh, demo to you is I am, I'm showing you here uh, Eugene City Council meeting. And the reason why I've chosen that is because in doing my due diligence, I went about and I said, who's using this software and how's it working? And sure enough, I found the city of Eugene, Oregon. I found some places in Colorado. Uh, a lot of different places were using the software because what it does is allow for keying to the agenda items portions of the video. So that's really the, the trick. That means that you come, you have a long agenda, have 15, 20, 30 items. You can click on any one of those and go directly to the video that covers that. I mean, that's my story. Now, it took a little bit to make sure this works, et cetera, and we're still working out some of the kinks. I, I jumped up and ran over there because although the little Mevo has a battery, the big battery is really important, and I forgot to push the button and turn on the big battery, so I had to redo that. But it's, it recovered, and um, what I'm showing you right now here is a city council meeting in Eugene, Oregon. And they're going about doing their business. It, it pops it when you click this to uh, their meeting, and they continue their meeting. But the real essence of this that makes this so good is that you can see the agenda over here on the side. Public forum, the mayor speaking. Here's the consent calendar. Public hearing, in this case on, uh, let's pick one here. Uh, this particular one right here. We click that, and what will happen is that um, we do it right, uh, close the dictionary. Sometimes equipment is too helpful. It will go directly to the public hearing and continue on with that. So the city of Eugene, Oregon, is using a more sophisticated camera system than we are. But my other point is, that if you're doing smaller meetings, it's very simple. Uh, the Mevo costs 400 bucks. Uh, and then you can bring that into a small meeting room. You can do whatever you want. Do that video recording. And of course, it utilizes the magic of parsing of all of the spoken words so it'll get about 80 to 90% correct. So that if you want to search by the word, or phrase plastic bag you can and find wherever in that meeting it occurred. That to me is the whole point of what we do, first as a radio station, is to help people tell stories but also to help people find stories. 
If you go back through materials very often, if you're prepping for the next meeting, you may want to do that. So what we're doing today is a simple thing. We are uh, we're actually providing um, a stream video out there. That's what you saw. Doug was being streamed live. But we are also able to record it, and then we will put the agenda, I'll take the agenda, and I'll key it to those elements. It's very easy to do. And I'm going to show you a couple other places where that's happening. So here's the Smart Communities Meeting, Matsuburo Admin Building. We have built uh, what's called a landing page. And on that landing page, because for the City of Palmer, we have not only the City of Palmer Council meetings, public meetings, and we consider this to be a public meeting, untold stories, which some of you may have uh, been aware of. Uh, it's a storytelling operation at the Palmer Depot. Uh, we did that. Um, but we also do the airport advisory committee, the planning committee, all of those things, and make them available in an archive fashion that's all done. So that if you want to go back and say, yes, we're going forward on this, we're, we, and, and I've watched the assembly and I've watched the city council talk about things and say, didn't we? And certainly minutes, written minutes, convey some of that, and even some of the recordings convey some of that. But Think about if you're preparing for a meeting and you wanted to go back and look and say, what did we say about that? What was the nuance that was conveyed there? That's what we're, we're suggesting people may want to consider doing. That's what will happen with this meeting. So for example, earlier on, we did this. And sure enough, at the beginning, I put this. This is stored. So there we have people getting ready for this meeting and doing this. So. I recorded that whole part. It's available now. You can go back and look at it if, if you want to check and see what, what was said, et cetera. Now we talk about live streaming. What I've done here is I've, I control this. So that I'm controlling this from back in the room there. And I'm taking the audio that's coming in from any of the devices that are being used, this mic, et cetera. And I'm bringing, as you can see, it's a little slight delay, as you might expect. So back in the media room, I have a small iPad. And with that, I can control zooming in, zooming out, et cetera. So I've zoomed in to capture the people who are doing this. As you begin participating more, we'd like to invite you to use this mic if you're going to ask a really important question, because that'll feed the audio in better. And We'll make available to you, and you all receive, I'll, I'll share with Doug the reference point uh, where you can go and look at this later on, or share it with some of the perhaps members of your community that weren't able to be here. So that's pretty much my story. It's a fairly simple one. Um, and this is a... Uh, this, this here, once again, we're, we're looking at, there is also a reference to open media. It's the Open Media Foundation. And uh, I, I would in, encourage you, uh, being a 501c3 with a purpose to improve transparency in government, they're continually evolving their process. I'm not, and they are relatively inexpensive. I know there are, there are many, as we know, many software solutions to all kinds of things their commercial ones, et cetera. When I had my conversation with the people that were using this particular platform, I asked them the question, OK, have you experienced with others? Why are you using this? If you're an organization such as the city of Eugene, Oregon, you're pretty big. Why did you decide to do this? And they said, one, it works. Two, it was cheap. OK, I like both of those answers. So that's what we've chosen. We'll be um, using it for as many different uh, events as we can. Uh, and uh, hopefully, we can give you an update uh, as we become more uh, functionally literate so we, the little things don't get in our way, like not turning on the battery. Do you have any questions? Yes, in the back. Thank you for that question. Is there a way to get audio only? What we, what we have done typically is two things. So for example, 
uh, there was a very full Palmer City Council meeting uh, this past Tuesday. I did both the video and our traditional audio. So what I, one way we have of disseminating the, the fact that this exists is to put it on our website. So if you go to RadioFreePalmer.org, for example, we have a, a posting there and we have the audio and then we also have the video. And when we're in the live situation, we tend to stream the audio separately so that people have that choice. Um, they've been very, they've been pretty good about developing this. So uh, I'm using the Wi-Fi system that's here. It's possible to connect through the ethernet system as well. Uh, but if I choose a, a slightly lower quality uh, video, it's been working pretty well in, in most circumstances. But from the listener standpoint, et cetera, uh, we'd probably make a uh, two-part solution with audio and video is your choice. Okay, other questions? Anything else? Well, if not, thank you very much for listening. And uh, I'll now probably go into the little room to make sure that we do the best type of uh, viewing. Thank you, Doug. And uh, for those of you, I think we have two people on the WebEx right now, so they're seeing this right now. So we, we know for next time, I'll make sure we get that bit kind of streamed onto the WebEx. We've got 15 minutes. We're going to have a gentleman from Austin uh, join us here in a few minutes. So now's the time to take a break. We still have, I think, snacks back in the, the next room. So we'll be back in a few minutes. He'll present. All right, Jay, here's Doug. Hi, Jay. Hi, how are you doing? All right, doing well. Thank you for uh, your right on time. Appreciate that. We're just kind of getting you dialed in. Right now, we just see the WebEx uh, uh, dashboard. Um, don't see your slide uh, yet, but um, we'll look. Oh, do I need to uh, hold on? Share screen. There you go. Yep, we see it coming up. Perfect. Yep. And All right. I think we expand it. Good deal. Okay. Yeah, we're all dialed in. We see your uh, presentation. So we've got about, uh, like we talked about a couple weeks ago, we have about 50 folks in the room from agencies and uh, companies and utilities here in the Alaska area. And um, we actually happen to be live streaming it too, probably to all of like three people. Um, we're trying it out uh, this morning uh, through a through a, a local technology um, open media project um, who's helped us uh, get that set up. So anyway, we are live streaming a little bit um, today. And then, of course, we have the WebEx. And primarily, you're the, the one person that's uh, WebExing uh, today with us here in the room. Um, and you're the presenter. So I've told people a little bit about um, Austin City UP. But I'm going to go ahead and uh, leave it to you to introduce. And like I said, you can do the presentation. And we can um, you can ask for questions when it's uh, convenient for you. Great. Well, I'm not going to do very many slides. I'm going to give you an overview and then leave most of it for discussion. <clears throat> but I'll do a few here to tell you a little bit about what Austin City Up is and, and why it is. So can you see the first slide here on what is Austin City Up? Yes, we can. Yep. Great. Okay. So Austin City Up is a nonprofit consortium, and the goal was to bring together really a, a lot of companies, also nonprofit organizations, civic groups, and foundations, higher education institutions, research groups, and labs, uh, the city of Austin, Capital Metro, which is not governed by the city of Austin. It's a non-governmental uh, organization, and other government orgs, and then any interested individual. So you can really think of this as a nonprofit consortium open to anyone the majority of the members, of course, are going to be the many, many, many private sector companies from large to small. And so just because there's far more companies than there are city departments or higher ed departments in a city, a metro area of 2 million people. And so we set it up, though, to bring all these different kinds of stakeholders together to share information, to develop collaborations, and to pursue projects that would advance Austin um, through technology data analytics and modeling. And so most smart city definitions include technology data and analytics, 
we specifically added modeling in there because we do believe that there'll be a lot of simulation in the future when the models are, when simulation models are sufficiently evolved to start doing predictive analytics through simulation, I'm sorry, predictive uh, decision making through simulation as well as through analytics. So we incorporated that in here. The rationale was very simple. Um, the smart city market is relatively new and small in the U.S. That doesn't mean that there's not a lot of uh, usage of the terms, but as we all know, um, there are some international cities uh, in countries that have really embraced smart cities more aggressively. Um, you know, Dubai is certainly a great example. Um, Singapore is certainly a great example. Uh, various cities in Europe, such as Copenhagen and London, are great examples. Um, there are uh, China, many cities in China, and India has a smart cities plan for a large number of smart cities. And so, you know, we can, we can all pretend we're data and we're all um, societal experts and sort of take the data at hand and surmise why some places are potentially ahead of the U.S. when we're at the forefront of technology. Why are we not at the forefront front of smart city efforts? And I think that, you know, we all know the answer must have to do something with not just technology leadership, but societal uh, importance, uh, uh, societal integration of the ideas of smart cities um, certainly has something to do with our, our, our political landscape and government factors and cultural uh, uh, concerns and societal concerns about privacy and data and surveillance and things like that. So for a number of reasons, the U.S. is not really in the lead in smart city efforts, and uh, despite having, of course, great potential for it. And when I was going around the country a few years ago and hearing about these efforts, I found that most of the efforts were disconnected. So even when I talked to efforts in the same city, I'd find that those efforts weren't talking to each other. Um, and that, of course, is, is a problem if you're really trying to build a smart city. Um, as the Dec uh, Deputy Secretary of Transportation, uh, Mark Dowd, said a few years ago, he doesn't believe there are any smart cities in the world because no city is fully embracing data analytic and analytics integration at scale across domains. And I, I've sort of seen that as well, and it was part of the rationale for creating Austin City Up. So we know that there are problems that are transportation problems. We know that there are problems that are housing problems. We know that there are problems that are health problems. We know that there are problems that are sustainability problems. But we also know that the challenges for, in, in cities and in communities more generally are generally tied together across those. So, for example, in Austin, we're having a tremendous uh, economic boom that has been sustained almost consistently over nearly 40 years since we became a tech city. Most every year we're rated as one of the best places to live, one of the fastest growing cities, et cetera. And a lot of this has been driven by the tech boom that started right around 1970, early uh, 1970s. Well, what has that created? It's a fast-growing population generally outpaces the physical infrastructure, so you can guess that we have traffic and congestion issues. And it creates increased pressure when it's economically driven by the tech sector, a relatively affluent sector. It creates pricing pressure on housing. So if you've got pricing pressure on housing, you find that people need to move farther out if they're not in that tech sector on average. If they're in a sector that pays less on average, they're moving farther out from the center of the city, which has been exploding in popularity as a place to live. And in fact, many tech companies like Google and Facebook and Box and Dropbox and others have set up shop right in the center of the city. So that ties then into the transportation issues. And we're finding housing and, trans and mobility issues are, t are both independent issues, but also tied together and related to each other. So we wanted to create a consortium that while it would look at some of these details in depth, it would also look at solutions that cross the domains. Um, 
We also found that they were challenging to sustain, and we're struggling with this too. I, I don't want anyone to read this slide and say, oh, the rationale was because it's challenging to sustain. Maybe they solved it. We haven't solved it. We just articulated that this is one of the challenges in the U.S., and we've, uh, there, that has led us to explore some of the reasons that it's challenging to sustain, which we hope will lead to some solutions this year in 2018 and 2019 for our efforts. And, of course, they're complex, and I already alluded to that when I talked about disconnected. They, they span many domains and often have limited data and models. So, you know, every single one of us on this call has heard the phrase big data. Every single one of us knows that companies are treating their data as gold and, and harvesting the insights in that data. And sure, many are struggling with advanced analytics techniques and only beginning to embrace artificial intelligence techniques like machine learning and deep learning. Nonetheless, companies wouldn't dream of not using their databases, their data in databases and using business intelligence tools and statistics. And many have embraced tools like Hadoop and Spark. So in cities, however, there's often very little data collected, unlike companies, which are constantly collecting transactional data and, and other enterprise data. And the data is often not integrated. And even when the city has a, a, an open data portal, it's usually sparsely populated. It contains, doesn't contain real-time data. It contains, or rarely, it contains periodic dumps of data from different departments, but by no means all. So these were the three really big issues. Disconnected projects, it's a complex problem with sparse data anyway, and it's challenging to sustain these, especially in the U.S., where most of our cities are funded by some form of taxes, uh, uh, some harsh portion of sales tax, some portion of property tax, some uh, uh, other methods. But basically, city budgets sort of scale with population, and population sort of scales flatly most you know, years. Even in a fast-growing city like Austin, it's not growing by 25% per year. So these civic budgets are largely to first order the same year after year and previously allocated already to a lot of OPEX uh, constraints like fire department and police department and roads and, and so on. So there's a growing awareness of the importance of smart cities. You guys are certainly part of that. And uh, this slide is now old. Last 12 months was when I typed it two years ago. I'd say really in the last three years now, we've seen a growing attention to smart cities. And I, I really should have done a Google trend plot for this to prove that the, there's been an uptick over the last few years. And I think that was really exemplified uh, a little over a year ago in the um, U.S. Department of Transportation Smart Cities Challenge. It made national headlines that there was a, a $50 million uh, award for one city in the U.S., and many, many cities competed. And many have leveraged their proposal efforts to at least engage in some of the things they proposed, even if they didn't win. So we've really seen an uptick in the last three years in the U.S. in smart city awareness and the beginnings of some efforts. And I've already mentioned this. I, I don't need to teach this audience this. This is for more a general audience. But I know this audience is aware that all of these issues and others are potentially addressable, at least in part, by smart city approaches. So our vision, well, with all these challenges and complexities, and I, I don't know what the folks on this call know about Austin, but uh, Texas is a super proud state, uh, possibly obnoxiously proud at times. Um, and uh, Austin is nothing like the rest of Texas. The former governor, now um, Secretary of Energy, once referred to Austin as the blueberry in the tomato soup. Um, it is a very liberal, progressive city with cultural attitudes and political leanings that are very different than the rest of the state. But it is no different than the rest of the state in its pride. And in fact, Austin prides itself on being one of the most creative cities in the country, one of the most technologically savvy cities in the country, and yet in the smart city arena, we were a zero a few years ago. And this was shocking to me. I mean, the U.S. was behind many parts of the world, and Austin, this wonderful city home to 
one of only, you know, a, a handful of IBM research labs, the founding place for Dell, the home of most of the C-level execs for AMD, um, uh, the, the home of the University of Texas at Austin, one of the largest and best research universities. Um, it, just, it just was a zero in smart city efforts. And so, so I said, well, one way to maybe move ahead is to uh, take advantage of all the technology and creativity aspects of Austin, uh, to take advantage of the pride of a city like this in its creativity and technology, and craft a vision that is bigger and bolder than what we're seeing in other U.S. cities that are dabbling their toes into the shallow end, we came out of the gate and said, well, our vision is to create a comprehensive, integrated, inclusive, sustainable, advancing smart city infrastructure. So we're going to go for the whole schlemiel, the thing that Mark Dowd says doesn't exist anywhere, not in the U.S. and not in the world. And we're driven by that vision, and it will be years before we achieve that vision because of the state of standards in smart city efforts. They're just beginning to um, be created, and they're rapidly evolving. And we talked about these complexities of these different domains that have data of very different types and time scales. Um, there's just a lot of complexities in achieving this vision, but if you don't start with the end in mind, you're not going to achieve the end. Um, so we started with the end in mind. This is, gonna, this is our vision. We want to be the first U.S. city. And if we're not, that's great. That just means somebody else solved it. But that is going to be our vision, not to just have a project in mobility over here and a project in health over there and a project in workforce development over there, but to really try to develop some, some integrative capability and to make sure that we're covering all of the bases while we're developing the integrative capability. So we said it would be a smart city infrastructure and we, you know, this is a very long vision statement because we wanted to put in improve operations, services, and quality of life while increasing efficiencies and reducing costs for the city and its constituents. So we know that it's not just about the city government. There are, are uh, the city government does a tiny portion of the city. It does not all of the laws that are, are govern daily life are city ordinances. A um, small percentage of the people work in city government. It, uh, the city government is certainly one of the major stakeholders in building a smart city and a smart community in the region. And so we knew that we had to put in increasing efficiencies and reducing costs, as well as improving operations, services, and quality of life. So we have lots of members in this. We might be the largest smart city consortium in the country. I, I've never seen a list as large. as This list on here, by the way, is probably not complete. Um, we probably have about 70 members, and then uh, probably another 15 or 20 individual members, despite not having started our individual members program with any PR. So there's a lot of big companies and small companies, city departments, startups, nonprofit organizations that have all come together to believe in this vision. Now, let me, let me emphasize something here. Not all these companies are Austin companies. Many of them exist and have offices all over the United States, in Austin, in Alaska, and everything in between. It's not that they believe that Austin should be the smart city. None of them in smart cities believe we should be the smart city. We, should be, we all believe that all cities should be smart cities. Why some of these national and global companies have joined in this project is because of that vision I presented on the previous slide. They're engaged in smart city projects, in many cases, in other cities, and in, in many cases more involved in other cities. But they wanted to be a part of an effort that was going to try to go broad as well as deep. And that's what we're trying to do in Austin. So our objectives, you heard that grand vision. So our objectives to achieve that vision are these four to articulate, evaluate, and prioritize city needs and priorities for smart city efforts. And in fact, we have conducted some civic priorities workshops, and we're going to conduct a new enhanced version of it on May 22nd in the afternoon. And if by any chance 
any of you are going to be in the Austin area on May 22nd, I would love to invite you to that. We're going to have about a dozen speakers from the city of Austin review the new city of Austin strategic priorities, and we will map that for relevance to smart city approaches. Now, we all know not all city priorities are smart city solutions, or in whole or in part. So we have to look at what needs to get done in the city and then filter that against what our smart city consortium can contribute to. There'll be some things that we can't contribute to, but many, many that we can. So we want to be guided by what needs to get done and what most needs to get done. Easy to envision smart city projects that are cool uses of technology, data, and analytics, but in the end don't really move the needle in terms of quality of life, efficiency of operations, et cetera. Um, so we want to be driven by that, and that May 22nd workshop will be our chance to revise the civic priorities work we did a year and a half ago and sort of finalize it now that our city council has done something it's never done before, which is document its top priority, strategic priorities for the city of Austin. So that's number one. Number two is to share information and develop collaborations among smart city efforts and with related efforts that elevate their impact and value. So in fact, me being on this call and all the learning I expect to do from you when I shut up here in a few minutes, um, as well as whatever I can share, that is directly related to this. We want we want to do it within the, the members of the consortium and also share those nationwide because, again, to first order, smart city efforts shouldn't be competitive. They should be supportive of all cities advancing. Now, in saying that, the Smart Cities Council reminds us that some cities are engaging in smart city efforts to be competitive, to be outcompete other cities in attracting the best businesses to them. And so that is certainly a fair approach. We don't really see it that way in Austin because we're pretty happy. We think we have the best live music, the best breakfast tacos, and the best nightlife. So we feel pretty good about our city overall. We want to share everything we do in smart city efforts with everybody else. But, you know, there are definitely some cities that are pursuing smart city efforts as a differentiator to attract businesses there. And that makes a lot of sense as well. But even those cities, of course, share the advances they make because Nobody wants to hold back smart health initiatives, smart safety initiatives. Um, so, and we want to elevate all of our members' activities. If someone joins Austin City Up and we don't achieve our vision, but that member forms some collaborations that advance its own smart city efforts, they should consider that a success. The third is to identify and pursue new smart city projects and funding to address it. So item three is where we're now shifting all attention. After two years of consortium building and form, forming some unfunded projects, item three is really objective where we're placing a lot of attention now. So in June, we will have a project formulation workshop with business plans using business uh, uh, model canvas uh, as a technique as part of that planning process. So we do have a few projects, including a couple that have funding now. We have members that have their own smart city projects that have offered them as collaborative projects through the consortium, so they were already funded internally, and they're now Austin City Up projects. And we're beginning now to really ramp up efforts to pursue new funding for new projects that will help us address civic priorities, item one, build collaborations, item two, and ultimately achieve our vision, which is also objective four on here, which is to develop this comprehensive, integrated, inclusive, sustainable smart city. And we wanted to have an API for new collaborators and contributions to come on board at any time. So anything we do with city support of any type, financial or even just participatory, must be open enough for other parties to join in and contribute. So, for example, even though we're going to use Cisco Data Platform in one of our projects, we will be open to using other data platforms in that as well, and the data will be open data subject to city ordinances and rules. So
So we will leverage the tools and technologies of our members, but always with the, an eye on being open. And I don't mean just open data and open source, because in some cases the data has to be protected. In some cases it'll use proprietary code, but it'll be open to collaborators and contributions. And so the progress is good. We really like our vision. Um, we're making progress on the current status of smart city projects uh, and overcoming some of the project, uh, issues in other cities. We've got good uh, uh, discussion among our projects now. And we're building this consortium of active participants. Not all our participants are very active. I want to be honest about that. But I would say at least half and probably a good majority are active participants in the consortium. Uh, some are passive and waiting until they see, you know, bigger funding opportunities. And we're really using civic needs and priorities to drive our efforts forward. Now, we're at an interesting time where I didn't want to give you a lot of details about things because things are going to change a lot in May, June, and July due to the fact that we have a new civic priorities forum that we're going to start advertising tomorrow on May 22nd. After that, we'll have a new data and instrumentation, oh, I'm sorry, a new solutions design workshop in June. And then we'll actually award some resources and even limited funding to some of those projects in July or August. So our, we have a big summer planned for our consortium. And that is all I wanted to share with you in terms of slides. Now I will go to our website. Can you all see the uh, website on the screen? Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can. Okay, great. So what I've done is I've pulled up here a, um, and let me try to zoom out just a little bit to make this a little bit bigger. Oops, I zoom in, sorry. So some of the projects that we're working on are things like an affordable housing app. So we have 2 million people in our metro area. Our unemployment rate is relatively low, but we have about 2,000 homeless persons in Austin, and we have a much greater number struggling with affordable housing. We do not currently have a real-time database of affordable housing options, of places that take Section 8 vouchers. So just this morning, we had our first workshop convening people from the City of Austin, from the Housing Authority, uh, the Department of Neighborhood Housing, from various startups that are building micro houses and tiny homes that are super modern and efficient, from Apartments.com, from various people in the public and private sector that are coming together to figure out, can we create a business model, a sustainable business model that we can scale to other cities so that every city would at all times have a real time accurate stream of affordable housing options? Because as we all know, if you suddenly find yourself without housing that and shelter, that becomes the number one issue for protecting your family. And that can cause a ripple effect, a negative ripple effect in other aspects of your life. So we want to reduce the pressure and reduce the time delays in people finding affordable housing options as the, the pressure on housing prices continues to increase in Austin. So I had a great workshop about that today. It's a small funded project with some seed funding from the city of Austin. IBM, uh, one of their data analysts, is one of the leaders of that project. And you can guess IBM isn't doing that project because they think it will only have value in Austin. And they're certainly not doing it because they think it won't have any profit at all. They think that they've got a model with modest profit such that it can be scaled out to other cities and sustain itself. And so I'm, I'm very excited about that project and we look forward to sharing that with the world uh, probably later this summer. Um, a project that I'm leading, which we just renamed, I think, yesterday, is the Smart Austin Innovation Lab. We are not the leaders in Austin in urban data and instrumentation labs. For that, I would suggest you look to cities like Chicago in the Array of Things project, like Kansas City that has a wonderful urban living lab, uh, like Dallas and the Dallas Innovation Alliance's living lab. We we look up to those cities and some of those leaders, but we also 
think that we're pretty smart and creative here in Austin. We've paid attention to those projects. And we're developing plans for the Smart Austin Innovation Lab that will include beacons and some non-personal data sensors like temperature gauges and some smart kiosks in phase one, but will include sound sensors, atmospheric quality sensors, uh, video cameras, and other instrument types in phase two. Now, we want to make sure that we're using the beacons and smart kiosks to inform residents and visitors, but we want to make sure we're using sensors up to and including cameras to collect useful information that we can use to, to improve operations and quality of life. So we're in the phase right now where we're discussing and reviewing the policies on personal data uh, that other cities have implemented in order to use cameras as sensors without risking uh, people's personal information. Now, I'm not sure where you are in Alaska on this, and we'll, I'm sure we'll get to discussion here in just a few more minutes. But um, there, are company, or there are projects like the Array of Things in Chicago where they recognize that video cameras are, can be general purpose sensors because you can use machine learning algorithms to identify what you see in the images. So for example, one of the things they do in Chicago is they want to know how much standing water is on the streets. Well, a few years ago, all of us would have said, well, then you put water gauges on the streets and the gauge will tell you how deep the water is. Well, you could do that, but it turns out you can use a video camera and train it to recognize depths that you pre-measure and train your model and then you never need to have those gauges. You can analyze the imagery and know how deep the water is. And that may seem obvious in hindsight, but there are many examples of where a camera can pick up data, and if you've trained a model using machine learning techniques, it can infer things about the environment that you would normally have had to measure with a dedicated sensor. Now, what they do in Chicago is they blur out the faces at the edge so that no recognizable facial features are ever uploaded to the cloud. Um, another good example of this is a company called Sentia. If you Google, I probably shouldn't pick a search engine. If you use a web search engine or, or just type in the, the URL, Sentia, S-E-N-T-I-A dot A-I, you'll see an example of a European company that is basically making, I guess they would call them optical sensors. They're using cameras but because of Europe's uh, uh, GPDR rules, they're very protective about personal identities. But they also recognize that cameras plus machine learning can tell you a lot about the envir environment while scrubbing out some of the facial, uh, the personally identifiable data. So we're looking at that for the Smart Austin Innovation Lab as well. Uh, down here in the bottom right is transportation kiosk, Capital Metro is deploying some proof of concept ones to try to understand how people really use these kiosks. Will they use them for better mobility options and can they be almost Trojan horses for other sensors? Can they be vehicles for local Wi-Fi? We, again, we have a homeless population that is only roughly 2,000 out of 2 million people, but that's 2,000 too many. Now the good news is many of them have acquired uh, devices that can connect to the internet, but of course they don't have data plans. So one of the uses of these kiosks in these environments is to provide free Wi-Fi and then access to social services information so that you can either access that information directly on the kiosk or privately on any device you have that can connect to the Wi-Fi provided by that kiosk. We also found that a number of our city departments value sharing information with the public so the public understands where the, the revenue is going and what the return on investment for these civic projects is. Because, you know, everybody, you know, knows the city has a big budget. People often don't know what that does and they wonder if it's wasted. Well, the city, uh, I, I really think very highly of the <laughs> every city staff professional I've met in Austin. We've been complimented on the quality of our city staff, their passion, their dedication, their talent by our visitors from other cities. 
they're really quite exceptional, but it's hard for them to get the word out about some of their great efforts. And uh, we want to make sure those efforts are understood and appreciated, and that we can even get feedback from the community once they understand uh, some of these initiatives, how they can contribute ideas that make them even better. So these transportation kiosks will actually serve many, many purposes. There's a number of other projects. They're not all described on our website yet, but they will be over the next month. Um, <clears throat> another one that I would like to just highlight for you, and I can't describe it very well, but it's the Smart Movement Tracks project that's in the middle of the right column. Um, Hope Young is a remarkable, talented, and passionate health professional who runs the Center for Music Therapy. And they uh, study various uh, illnesses and conditions and how music can be part of the therapeutic treatment of that. And yet, um, they need to be able to monitor the activity of, of people wearing their devices and make sure that they have continuous availability to that data and that the person uh, wearing the infrastructure has uh, persistent connectivity to the network and high enough bandwidth to transmit the kind of data that their sensors are collecting. So the smart movement tracks is really excited about 5G in the future and having ubiquitous high bandwidth network that can support a, a generation of applications that require 10x the bandwidth of current 4G networks and the much lower latency as well that 5G provides. And so we'll have more information on that soon as well. So that's what I wanted to share with you about our organization. Now we've also just started uh, a news and blog, and so we've got some things that we, just a few posts in here so far, but we're going to ramp this up this summer. Uh, we are uh, basically going to share more with the world over this summer and this fall. A lot of it's been meetings that we have, weekly and biweekly meetings among both committees, and the committees are usually focused on domains like transportation or health um, or energy. Um, some of them are cross-cutting committees like data. And then some of them are, some of our uh, meetings are project meetings as opposed to committee meetings. Projects are still often domain focused, but the Smart Austin Innovation Lab, the SAIL project, is intended to be a horizontal project, an integrative project, because as you'll remember from the first couple of slides, our vision is ultimately to integrate all of our solutions data outputs to enable analytics across all of our different data sources so that people can solve the hard problems, like how pricing of homes relates to our transportation issues, how that relates to economic development and the amount of shopping in different shopping areas between home and work endpoints, how that relates to health issues as people spend more and more time in their cars and at a higher rate of uh, a higher level of stress, and so on. So got a grand vision, got some simple early goals. We have a large consortium. We formed about a half dozen projects and about a half dozen committees. A lot more coming after our upcoming workshops in May and June. Uh, very interested in sharing with others. Uh, we will start publishing more and sharing more here very soon. And we're interested in learning as much as we can from other efforts. In fact, we have a Lunch and Learn series on Wednesdays at noon central in which external projects will share via web conference, just like this, we actually use Uber conference for it, will share what they're doing. And sometimes it's companies with products and they're hopeful that we'll adopt it or some of our members will buy it. And that's fine too, as long as it's not a sales pitch, it's a smart city pitch. But we'd be happy to have any one or more of you talk about what's going on in Alaska and what's going on in your organizations in our uh, Lunch and Learn series on Wednesdays at noon central. Happy to get you scheduled if you're interested in sharing what you're doing with us. And with that, uh, I've been, man, I've been yapping constantly for 35 minutes. I'm sorry about that. I'm going to take a breath now, uh, ask if there's any questions, and then I hope I can ask you guys questions too. That's great, Jay. No, thank you so much. This is Doug. You know, I, I've got a question. Uh, we've talked a little bit offline um, 
that, and I told everybody here, this is you know an example of a type of forum that, that we're, we've been forming for the past couple of years, uh, a little bit different in terms of its, its membership model, and it's still a, 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 a growing effort. Um, a number of companies involved, but in this room we have local, state, and uh, I'm not sure federal agencies quite yet, um, but the number of companies in this room that have been participating. Jay, you know that it, it's initiated from the, the idea of uh, better sharing of data, avoid redundant use of data, avoid uh, multiple data stores of the same data, um, getting more information out to the public um, of all these data sources through a platform. There's uh, three uh, notable, what we call open data platforms from the Matsu borough um, that we're in today, and then just south of us is the municipality of Anchorage, the, the, the large municipalities of the south of us, about 300,000 people there. And then um, we have a state. Uh, state agencies have the multiple GIS platforms, some data platforms for to accessing data, particularly um, Department of Natural Resources. We're actually forming now what's called a statewide geo portal that's trying to consolidate uh, a lot of the data, or at least links to all these other data platforms. So you have a portal of portals, if you will. So that yeah. said, I, I do have a question about, you know, what, what's the city of Austin's and then the, 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 and the, the county of which you're in, what, what has been their role or what do they anticipate their role in what you're talking about here? Well, and I've just pulled up on the screen um, a blog site from the city of Austin's innovation department. So if you go to, let's see, let me make sure I put this up. If you go to our website, we have a blog roll of some of the blogs that we follow, and some of it, one of them is, includes the City of Austin's Design, Technology, and Innovation Fellows. The City of Austin has been, multiple departments have been members of Austin City Up, um, but it's not funded by the City of Austin. Now, those departments pay their annual dues, as a company does or a nonprofit does, but we don't get a large operational budget from the city. That being said, lots of folks in the CIO office from the city of Austin participate in our projects. And so I would say the relationships are good. The participation is good. We all still have to figure out a funding model that makes sense because I, I created this. I'm the founder, executive director, and I'm unpaid for it. I, we do pay a couple of staff people to uh, execute the events, to manage the finances, the contracts, the legal issues, et cetera. But um, in terms of the city of Austin, there isn't direct funding from the city of Austin for the organization, but there's direct participation and there's member funding in it. Now, this is all subject to change over the next several months because we've now having higher level meetings with the city about what makes sense going forward in smart city efforts. And so we have got um, an opportunity over the coming weeks to figure out what this should look like and how the city should participate going forward. And I think they like that we're a nonprofit consortium. I think in some ways that kind of shields them in some ways, and it brings people to the table as equal partners as opposed to under a city umbrella. And so I think, I think they like the fact that the private sector and the public sector are equal partners in it, but it does have some, of, some funding, some operational expense challenges that we have to solve. Um, that is, you and I talked on the phone, there are kind of two ways to solve this. One is with a small number of big ticket sponsors, and our method is with a large number of small membership fee members. Both of them have their merits. They can possibly be combined. Um, Dallas is looking at adopting our model, and we're looking at adopting Dallas's. So uh, uh, we'll, I'd say that the answer to how the city is participating is – still to be determined, but it's highly participatory in terms of input and activity in the projects and committees right now. Okay, great, thanks, Jay. Um, question. I'll just get a question right there. Pardon? Oh. Hi, Jay, this is Jeremy with Cisco Systems. Um, a question I have for you is that you, you caught my interest when you made the mention of the business model canvas that you used to facilitate a process of identifying sustainable solutions. Um, I was wondering yeah. if you could comment a little bit more on how you facilitate that process, if you do it or if somebody else does it. But I mean, 
I do appreciate the use of that framework and the value that it adds to that kind of a dialogue or discussion. So it, can you describe that a little bit more? Jeremy, uh, first of all, um, Cisco is a member, and thanks. I'm really appreciative that Cisco is a member, and Chris Blanding here is super active in Austin City Up. Um, the business model canvas, I'm going to just confess, I'm not the expert on it. Ron Baker of IBM is leading the efforts of the housing committee to use a business model canvas for its affordable, its real-time affordable housing data project. So Ron is easily the best person in Austin City to describe how we're using it. E even worse, Jeremy, <laughs> for the purposes of this question, is they were discussing how to use it while I was preparing for this call today. So they have probably updated their business model canvas. It's at 1.46 p.m. They have probably updated it by now, but I haven't even seen it yet because I haven't circled back with them. That, that workshop was going on this morning and uh, into the midday. So the best thing I can probably do is put you in touch with Ron Baker on that if you want. If you send an email to info at austincityup.org, um, we'll get that and we'll put you in touch with Ron Baker, and he'll talk about how that project is using business model canvas for a smart city effort. Thanks, Jay. Now, um, Jeremy, the, the, the final part is Ron's going to teach all of us how to do it. So in our late June workshop, we expect to draft business model canvases for a number of projects. But Ron is definitely the expert as of now, May, uh, I'm sorry, April 26th within our consortium for it. Excellent. Thanks, Jake. Other questions? Got time for a couple more. Okay. The um, Jay, I just a quick question on the the housing uh, data that you talked about. Uh, maybe I missed it. it. It's how would that be? Um, what do you envision how that would be hosted? I guess the the data, the platform, bringing it all together. Would it actually be not only facilitated the project through uh, Austin City UP? but how would it be actually hosted and like sustained? Um, that is a great question, and that's another one that I think that they worked out today, and so I don't have the answer to. Um, it'll be real-time data, and so I think that they were looking at various options for hosting real-time data today. Now, initially, it may not be real-time. It may be delayed by hours or a day or so, but I know their goal is to make it real-time since when somebody's in a moment of crisis, they go seeking help, and the stress level goes up if they don't find the help when they need it. So the point is to be real-time. But I, I'm not sure what they worked out for a technical solution today. If you, Again, if you send me an email, I will put them in touch with you and find out what they've used. Now, we, we do have Dell EMC as a member, uh, uh, Amazon Web Services as a member, um, the city has an open data portal um, based on Socrata. Uh, so we have a number of options we can look at. I'll be honest with you, I suspect IBM is going to volunteer to host some of that data early on while we're proving out the project, but I'm not positive of, of that plan. Um, they probably know it as of a couple hours ago. I just don't know it yet. Okay, great. Well, I mean, there's a lot of experimentation going on, a lot of engagement. We see a lot of similarities in alignment with what they're trying, we're trying to do here in Alaska. Uh, the Socrata platform is at the city of Muni, uh, city of Anchorage, um, as well as they have the, uh, the RTIS, um, uh, ESRI platform as well. Um, what I'll do, follow up, yeah. Jay, is I'll send you a number, a number of links that uh, the main three that I, I just referred to uh, a little bit ago is Matsu Borough and Muni of Anchorage, as well as uh, State DNR. And then we're working on this uh, statewide geo portal project to kind of be the portal of portals. Um, so I'll be able to send you some more information on that. Um, and just some of the, the, the successes that we've had over the last couple of years. Um, and I expect that we're going to be focusing on more uh, uh, digitization, digital um, solutions among all our participants come August, um, essentially how we're doing better about delivering information more regularly, more automated uh, to all the constituents, whether it be the public or to make it available to businesses or to tourists and so forth. So I really appreciate the time, and uh, we'll f I'll follow up later on. Oh, All right, well, thank you very much. I was going to show you the Affordable Solutions Housing Workshop Eventbrite, but I just realized in clicking on it, 
that if the event is over, it doesn't pull up the page. So we can send you the, the, the information that was on that page if you're interested or anything else you want about any of our projects. The only thing I'll say is more projects will be added to this menu and more information about those projects will be added over the next four to six weeks. So you'll see a lot more on there by the end, eight weeks, by the end of June. But we're happy to share what we can in email. And some of you apparently are like Jeremy, is it Cisco? Jeremy, by that um, affiliation, you're actually a member of Austin City Up. Cisco, the company, is the member. So if you want to join any of our Austin City Up lists, um, you're welcome to. That goes for anyone else on the call who's a member of any, who, who, who works with any um, Austin City Up member. And it's just maybe a new source of information for Smart Cities efforts. And we have lots of non-local members that join as well. So Excellent, Jay. I, we actually had one hand go up real quick. I'll just uh, give it to him. Hey, Jay. My name is Micah. So I'd be an individual member who hasn't signed up yet, but I'm wondering, is there a way that I could... Do you broadcast those, uh, let's say, members-only lunch events or the event on the 26th? Yep. Uh, the event on the 26th was this morning, so that's over. We do broadcast all of our events, though, via Uber conference, and we have a members. Uh, we give all the members the URL and information and everything, so yes. So, uh, yeah, we have, I, I would say probably on any given lunch and learn half the members, half the people calling in are remote. Um, so, yeah. Okay, Jay. Thanks again so much. I'm on the hook for the May 9th one for the Dell um, Digital City Strategy. So, um, hope, hope, I think that'll be a really interesting one for a lot of people. Dell's doing some interesting work there now. Um, also, I don't know. If, actually, I don't know if this one would make a lot of sense in Alaska. Have you all heard of Casita? They build these small stackable homes. I don't know how well insulated they are, and having lived in Alaska, I remember how important that is. <laughs> All right, Jay, thanks again so much. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. This happened to me last year too. I got to speak in Austin, Texas for the state CIO conference and I had to follow the, the guy who put the module on Mars. And I was like, how do you follow that? I just gotta bring you all back down to earth again. So I promise you, I do have a very and collaboration and maybe a discussion about training. So my name is Jim Bates. Um, I served the state for three years um, under two governors and four commissioners doing state IT. And I'm still here with most of my hair left, I think. Um, but in that time frame, there was a lot of collaboration with smart communities, um, smart states, innovations that were happening in a lot of the different states. So this is something I'm really passionate about. Um, I spent a year in Austin doing a project for Michael Dell's company there. And um, it was a really great learning experience for me and part of just briefly what we'll talk about today. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about maybe developing local talent and how we do it. This is my company, Business Improvement Group. Left the state uh, two years ago, and I do consulting and a lot of teaching, seminars, workshops. I focus on project management, business processes like the Lean Six Sigma stuff, and also information technology. Um, so uh, I did that prior to going to work for the state, took a little hiatus, and um, now here I am doing it again. I enjoy what I do. Uh, but doing that since in the last two years, I've had a lot of people ask me about, uh, with our state budgets, you know, how do maybe we do training smarter? And what can we do as a community to pull together, to pull resources? Um, I also adjunct at UAA. I use Blackboard, the learning management system. I'm also a student now as well, again. Never stop learning, right? And I'm using Blackboard as a student, so it really helps. Um, but I like this little thought, wise people learn when they can, fools learn when they must. <laughs> um, Duke of Wellington. Sometimes, you know, um, with all this change that's happening, 
we have to improve the way we do things, including learning, in my mind. And sometimes we get so busy trying to cut costs that if we would just take the time to, you know, put the round wheels on, we might save ourselves a lot of time. Um, I have some thoughts about how to do it, but I know there's others in the room as well that are probably going along the same thing. So what about workforce development? What happens when budgets tighten? People say, well, sorry, we're going to cut all your training <laughs> budget. That's what happened at the state. No more travel, no more training. Yet they're putting in new technology that they want our staff to somehow support. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. All right, so what effect does this ultimately have on the organization? I mean, some of you could probably come up with some ideas. What happens when you cut the training budget and you no longer develop your workforce or invest in them? You get behind the curve, and it actually has a, a, an adverse effect that costs the company ultimately more money usually, to my experience. Anyone have a different experience in here? All right, so what challenges do you face? Oh, we'll just outsource that department. We don't want to put money into it. And then you have a bunch of other issues that come in, right? So you're competing against, you know, what's the best business value for an organization? Does it really work? Usually we overreact and we run one way and we try to outsource everything and then we don't like that. And then we try to bring this some back in, in house again or on prem. And I know that a lot of business decision makers are saying, well, if I got to put money into training my staff, I'll just get rid of that department. I'll outsource it. And then you're dealing with somebody who you have to get an interpreter to understand or whatever, right? So when we place the major focus on efficiency, what happens to effectiveness? Yeah, so what happens is everyone says, hey, we got to cut cost, cut cost, cut cost, cut cost. I mean, I'm at the university doing some consulting. I see it in other, uh, some of the native corporations I consult with. Cut cost, cut cost, cut cost. And then what happens is you break effectiveness. And the whole reason why you're in business in the first place is undermined. If I'm a restaurant and everyone's, you know, the doctor's buying my biscuits because they're really good, and I say, I got to cut costs so I buy a cheaper flour, I ruin the effectiveness of my biscuits, ultimately I lose the long game. And so in my mind, what I see happening in the state when we have these budget crunches is everyone starts trying to become more efficient. They cut costs, and they, they cut out things that make you effective as an organization, and you really lose the long game. And so my thought is kind of, how do we start collaborating? Why does that happen? Just what we said. Um, to form a way that we can do strength training in the state. You know, I put this quote up there from Peter Drucker to kind of underscore what I just said. People focus on efficiency, doing, the thing, doing things right instead of on effectiveness, doing the, the right thing. <laughs> you can do the wrong things really good. And sometimes we do that, right? Um, so there's nothing so useless as doing efficiently that which should not be done at all and sometimes the other way around. You laugh, right? Because we can relate to that. Um, so how are we stacking up? I'm thinking about business strategies and workforce implications and how do you measure success in an organization on that investment. A lot of times I think, I know in IT we had a challenge sometimes of communicating to executives that held the budget and wanted to invest and, you know, we have ways of talking in geek terms, you know. Metadata, blah, 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 and business people are going, what? You know, they don't want quarter-inch drill bits. They want quarter-inch holes. So we as IT need to be better at communicating what that investment's going to do. I remember at the state, um, Dillingham had really bad bandwidth, which is, the, you know, the, the pipe size of getting communications out there. Eight agencies, including, you know, parks, uh, you, you know, it ramped up in the summertime. We had latency, which 600 milliseconds to you geeks in a room, but that's an average latency is like, Push a button here for the business folks. Get coffee, come back, maybe your screen's up, hit another button, go over here and check the mail. That's how bad it was. And so we kept saying, we need money for investment for bandwidth. Finally, I said, hmm, I got to talk their language and figure it out. The same thing with training. What I'm trying to say here is how to relate this to get money for training investment and prove to them the value we get out of that. So I finally said, hey, I need, a, I need some investment for Dillingham so we can educate more kids. What? Got someone's attention in the Department of Education. Uh, we need to solve crime faster out there. Talk to one of the troopers. He says, I can't even use my crime solving software out there. It's so slow. You know, we, we're getting information too slowly to be able to do it, right? Um, hey, I need to be able to do healthcare better in Dillingham. So finding ways to use metrics to say, if you invest this much money into this bandwidth investment, here's what we're going to actually do for the business. We're going to educate this many kids per whatever investment dollar. Um, we'll have this, you know, 
the, the crime software will work better. Same thing with training. In my mind, is if we can find a way to metrically prove that investment in training and workforce development helps the company move the big needle and become effective, then that's an efficiency gain, right, that's meaningful instead of breaking effectiveness. So the thought is, and here's where I'm about to end up, because I'm going to get the time back, I'm hoping, because I, I, I was the short speaker, and we kind of went a little bit over in that last section. So here's, here's how do we share resources? Can't, can't send workforce out of state anymore, which we all used to love to do, right? Training. I get to go out of state and go shopping at the big malls and go to a really cool restaurant we don't have in Alaska. Well, now come you're saying no more out-of-state travel. So can't bear the cost of training alone, so maybe I can't afford to bring up an instructor out of state. So what if we found a way to collaborate and say, what is the demand for training and what kind of training are we looking for? And then what is the supply and broker that? And say, okay, can we share those costs? That's the thought that I kind of have. Um, how can we measure success value for investment? What is the way that we can prove to the, the decision makers and those that are investing the money and in that this is actually moving the needle for you as an organization and it is an efficient way of doing something, but we're still being effective, right? And there are ways to engage leadership, and that's what I'm thinking about. So push versus pull. You know, I'm, I'm trying to help with the training that I do, but I feel like sometimes I hated it as a state you know, being our CIO, per se, getting 20 million emails from vendors wanting to sell me something, and I don't like spam in my email box. So rather than it be like I'm trying to push things, I want to try and help broker that with, now I've learned there's others probably doing this, similar things. Is there ways we can kind of pull on demand and say, hey, I have a need, put it out there and see if we can find resources and collaborate and become smarter as a community on how we do this training and investment in our workforces, and that's where I end up. So I, I, got my t I got some time back, almost. I'm going to tell you time, actually, at this point. Yeah, so I just wanted to start the discussion, get people thinking, maybe make some networking happen here. Um, and find a way that I can help broker this because I was born and raised in Alaska. This is my state. Love this place. Um, I hate seeing when I don't mind some of the people leave and <laughs> some of them should go. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's sad to see what happens when the oil revenue hits our state and it starts trickling down. Um, you know, I love our universities. I love the communities here. I spent time all over the state. Um, in fact, I lived here, went to Palmer, a couple of grades in school. Um, so yeah, this is, this is something that I care about deeply and it's meaningful to me. And so my whole really, my motive here is to try and figure out a way to collaborate because I have customers coming to me saying, I need a certain kind of training. Well, I don't really provide that, but let me see if I can help you with it. And so I started thinking, well, is there a way we could network, find that demand, see if others had the same demand, and then we could broker that in a way that cuts costs for everybody. So any thoughts, questions? This is more like throw it out there and get everyone thinking. Man. Has there been an example of anybody? Er Eric's hand was up over there. Right. So. Yeah, that's good. So I also do training at UAA as an adjunct. Like I said, it's my hobby. I do one night a week. I don't mean it in the sense that it's not important. It's just that it's something I do just because I like to give back. But I also teach, um, I've been teaching classes every spring for the U.S. Forest Service Bureau of Land Management and watching them share and collaborate on training investment. And, you know, that kind of stuff works. I did a lot of work with, at the state with DNR and GIS mapping and the discussion about how that moving that over the pipe was not always, you know, simple and easy to do. Um, so that's, that's good stuff.
Steve in the back. Yep, I've heard that one. So um, I, if there's more questions, please just see me um, at later. I want to get out of the way for what's coming up next. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm eager to kind of get involved in this too. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Appreciate your time. All right. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Jim. And uh, quickly moving into our UAA presentation, which are geomatics. Uh, I'll let you introduce yourself. Thank you, Doug. Um, so... I think this is a perfect follow-up presentation after um, the big presentation uh, because we are here to provide a platform to train our young fellows into the professionals. Um, so uh, I'm very happy to be here today. Uh, my name is Kaisha Wong. Uh, so I'm a assistant professor of the geomatics at UAA. And uh, this is my fifth year, so, but I love Alaska. Uh, I think this is a great place, and even though sometimes challenging, and I think this is a lot of uh, opportunities for our students, okay? So I'm here to talk about our programs, uh, which is kind of old, old programs, but we have a lot of uh, innovations um, and the new technologies brought into the programs. And also, I want to show you some of the student project uh, to see what they're doing after they learn uh, about four years in our programs. Okay. Um, so a little bit of background before I talk about our programs. So my uh, background uh, is uh, I got my uh, master's and PhDs in US and my training is from the remote sensing and NGS. So I'm very interested to use the remote sensing technologies um, to collect the data and then update the data, integrate the geospatial data, and also share the data. So I think this is a perfect forum I like to be involved because that is a passion of my research for so many years. Um, so um, back to our department. So our department has been uh, founded uh, in 1974, and I saw some of our graduates here. Can you raise your hand, our program? Wow, more than I thought. Uh, I think um, because I joined five years ago, so some of you only Erin, I think. Um, so I saw her, uh, she graduated after I came, uh, but some of your folks, I didn't. Oh, there you go, hey. <laughs> I haven't seen you there. Um, so I'm very excited uh, to talk about programs because I think um, we are, uh, you know, uh, developed or Kind of involved in so many years we're small as you see only we have so far we have four faculty in the department um, but we have uh, our student body grow from maybe 10s 20s from years ago um, starting from 90s 70s and then now we are a little bit shy to 100 
So that is a big improvement, uh, and, uh, and also we contribute to the uh, work uh, workforce in, uh, in Alaska. And we also have uh, two or four adjuncts in the uh, in the programs. Um, the programs we offer, we're not just uh, focused on the traditional land surveying, as you see from the field. So we also have the GIS um, and remote sensing image analysis and photogrammetry. Now, some of the field, even though we are using the same term like you heard, um, but we actually introduced a lot of uh, new technologies. I'm going to talk about a little later after um, the next, uh, after this first slide. And um, our programs at actually, uh, um, BS programs is uh, ABIT uh, accreditation. Uh, so that, uh, you know, we are very kind of uh, value the, the quality of the education and we actually, um, you know, have a high uh, requirement for our students um, for graduation. Um, so that is, we are very proud of it. Now, can some of you guess how many similar programs like us in U.S.? Can you guess the number? 17 calls. Another guess? That's too big. We're <laughs> U.S., we don't have so many programs, especially four-year uh, programs in geomatics. So this is the number from uh, one year ago. I haven't checked this year, but it's only 12. So very small. Um, and the program itself also small. Um, but uh, it's not doesn't mean that we are not necessary. And uh, for our program, actually, we are the only one provide when you want to, uh, you know, get the licensure for a surveyor. So you have to take our four-year programs in Alaska. So we're the only programs and we're very proud of it uh, for that. Now, um, so we, I already talked a little bit about the high qualities of the education. Uh, so one of the examples is that our faculty are very uh, passionate to involve industry uh, professionals and also embrace the new technologies. So one of the good example is that we want to uh, the, the professionals and industry to be involved in our student project and this is great forum that we can start talking about it and um, previously we have very few uh, projects uh, which are actually directed and collected with the industry, but we want to increase that. So we are very open uh, to talk with those opportunities. Uh, so that's the one aspect, that's why I put the faculty-driven innovation. Another uh, aspect is that uh, we are actually uh, continue to uh, embrace the new technologies. Uh, one of the example is, I think, uh, was the new platform platforms of the UAS, um, unmanned area system, so I'm very passionate to use it to collect the data. Uh, one of the data is, of course, uh, images, uh, high resolution images. Uh, another one is that if you change the sensor, that's the beauty of it. So if you change the sensor from GoPro sensors to LiDAR sensor, so you get a LiDAR from UAS, or change the sensor to thermal sensors, you get thermal image. So different images you can use for different applications. And if you combine them together, for instance, one of the projects uh, I did um, for a nonprofit uh, organization, we are actually using the, uh, the um, image sensors, which is optical, uh, just the color images, with the multiple spectral sensors. So we combine both together so we can monitor the vegetation growth, uh, the health of the vegetation. So that is one of the example. If you, you know, this is a great opportunity um, for um, survey, right? Getting the data and the integrate data. So we involve those uh, in, uh, into the programs and then we give that and kind of uh, embrace those new technologies and educate our students how to, uh, you know, learn those new technologies, um, you know, get them ready for the new market. Okay, so that's one of the examples. Um, of course, uh, other faculty in the department, for instance, the um, struct from motion, I'm sure some of you already use that for uh, 3D uh, from the images. Uh, so that's another uh, new technology that actually we are 
very interested to uh, kind of uh, educate and then to use it in the project. Um, just a little bit about uh, our programs. Actually, we're not just to provide the BS in serving, uh, Bachelor of Science in serving. We also provide uh, the Bachelor of Science in geospatial science. Uh, so you can select different concentrations uh, for the Bachelor of the Science. And if you're interested in programming, so which is the, um, the customize some of the uh, tools, some of the software. So we are also introduced the geo developer, which is one of the project I'm gonna talk about, um, the one of the student actually using that techniques into or what they learned uh, into the center project. Um, we also have the two year programs. Uh, if you are not sure to commit the four years, and you can choose the AIS uh, in uh, Surmain. Uh, so that is uh, uh, one of the uh, programs. Uh, of course, in GS, we provide a minor, uh, minor in GS. Those are very popular uh, programs for folks who are not in geomatics, for instance, from geology, geography. Their students actually need this technologies uh, skill set. Uh, before they enter to the market. So um, most of our students in minor in jazz are from those um, uh, disciplines. And we're looking forward. So we are hopefully with the budget issue becomes uh, not a problem and we are able to expand uh, to graduate certificate, uh, graduate master of the science, um, graduate uh, programs. So I think that is uh, something I would like to talk with you um, maybe during uh, the lunch and then, you know, how we can, you know, how we can serve you uh, to provide the training to your uh, employees or, uh, you know, is there any way that we can collaborate uh, in terms of the, you know, training the new workforce uh, and so on. So that is uh, something I just leave it there. And I put a link, oops, I think it's cut off. Uh, by the slides, but I will leave my presentation here. So uh, you can go to my, our website and then to see what's the uh, update and we uh, frankly update our uh, website there uh, to get the information. And some of the highlights of our programs uh, include um, the uh, geomatic server, uh, which is helped by Adam's team. I think uh, this is a, his, he and his team is involved um, was involved since the beginning. Uh, so he actually he helped us to start it. And this is actually uh, a kind of remote desktop or remote computer if you talk about that. Uh, our students love it. Uh, the beauty of it is that uh, some students are using uh, Mac, right? Uh, you know, for, uh, and for homework. Um, and some students cannot come to the campus when they do the homework. But we have the license which is can only used on campus or uh, computers which are which belongs to the university. So for those students, um, they can easily access the geomatic server remotely, either from home or from their workspace, as long as they can access the internet. So and on this computer, they have all those software they need uh, for homeworks, projects, and so you name it. So we install that all the time, and it's running 24/7, and it's running smoothly. And then you know the 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 um, I think the speed is very smooth and quick. Uh, so our students love that, and this is actually help us to serve our students better, uh, so they don't have to come to the campus. Uh, so that's one of the highlights, and we are actually uh, installing another server uh, to kind of. Uh, uh, expand that cap capacity. So that's why by 2020, uh, all our programs will be online, um, but we also provide face-to-face. -face. So that means you don't have to come to UAA campus, but you still can get our program, get our degree from our department. Uh, so that is a goal um, for us, and we're working forward to that. So that's gonna help us to serve the students uh, remotely. Uh, so we're very excited about it. And um, there are some links actually, um, I put it here. So those are the links actually reported in the medium regarding our student, uh, regarding our project. Uh, so I um, invite you to kind of click on those links. Uh, so one of the links, um, I'll see if I can click here. So 
this is the one of the um, Cinder project. Um, So this is the um, Cinder project. Actually, they are uh, did um, the measurements for the Mount Marathon and actually correct the elevation uh, uh, for the tops, uh, even though that is still validated. Um, but I think uh, it's very interesting to the community and it's reported by the ADN. So I would like to invite you to go to those links and then look at those wonderful uh, project um, for, uh, from our students. Uh, some of, one of the projects I can uh, point it to is um, I'm talk about the drones and the Twitter. Uh, so this is the, another uh, project that I did for my research. Uh, so uh, you can go to that link to look at the details. Uh, so one of the, my um, aspect in terms of data collection, uh, we can collect the data using the land surveying, we can collect data using the drones, um, the UAS, and we can also collect data from social media. Um, Facebook is a different story. Um, that is uh, because uh, we're using the open uh, data, uh, which is published by the social media, for instance, the Twitter, for instance, um, uh, the, uh, you can name it. But um, so we're using those social media data for good. Uh, so that means one of my projects I'm doing is I'm using the data from on Twitter uh, to analyze the travel in last 10 years to Alaska. It is so hard to get travel data, uh, the, the uh, tourist data. So how often people from different locations, what time visit where in Alaska, and then in what time, right? So those are the data which is so hard to use the conven very conventional method. So I'm using the social media to get those data and then analyze it in terms of the data mining and then trying to figure out what are those hottest spots in Alaska, uh, primarily in Metro um, Anchorage and also in Julo. So where are those hot spots? And then do they have like peak hours in a day or in the season? And those are actually very helpful for our decision makings especially we have limited resources to allocate. So if we can find those information, those patterns, that's gonna help us. So that is one of the um, project I, I'm doing now. Um, you are inter uh, welcome to talk with me afterwards. Um, I, would, I cannot uh, ignore our very passionate and professional student association, which is the GSA. Uh, so I put it there. One of the things I invite, so. There are lots of beautiful pictures when they're doing the senior project and or that when they go to the um, middle schools to do uh, elementary schools to do the outreach. So that is a sandbox uh, they brought to there if you see the upper uh, left pictures. Uh, so it's a very interesting for those young kids. But for professional community, I would like to invite you to uh, kind of involved with our GSA. You can be involved very easily. For instance, if you have a project and you are very welcome to share those projects with our students, you can become a guest speaker uh, to, the, um, you know, uh, to this GSA and they're gonna have a regular meetings every semester. Uh, so I put the uh, you know, contact email there and also I have a, a flyer in the table uh, and near the end of the room, you are welcome to bring a flyer. Uh, so get yourself involved and then introduce your project or talk with the student to see if they can work on part of your project during the senior uh, capstone project. So that is a great, I think, um, collaboration between the professional communities and with our uh, college, uh, with our university. And it's also gonna help our students to gain the actually experience before they graduate. Okay. And also it's gonna help your project, um, you know, because we are actually, we don't charge you. <laughs> so it's a good win-win situation. Um, so I welcome you to kind of uh, think about it uh, for those opportunities. Um, so the last, um, I still have five minutes, right? Okay. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the project. Um, I think I may not be able to demo it, uh, but uh, I include the link there. So you are welcome to look at those links. 
Uh, so the first project is a capstone project, uh, which was uh, developed by Shan and Ryan in 2017, so last year's spring. And they actually um, developed a Chugak trail collector mobile apps, which is very cool. Um, so um, let me ignore uh, part of the background just to talk about why they're doing this. I think they are very passionate outdoor um, players. Um, so they like to go out in the winter time, but the struggling for them, so they came up this project from their own experience. Uh, something very troubling for them is that it's hard to find the updated status of the trails, right? Um, you may find it from here and there, but they are either out of dated or not complete. For instance, is that trail snow covered, um, or is it the depths of the snow, or is a uh, uh, you know uh, uh, you know groomed or so? So they want to kind of uh, what if we have this apps developed using this capstone capstone project, and then we can kind of publish it, and every people can contribute to that app, and then can contribute to that information, so other people can you know, benefit from the information from other users. So that is basically what they, you know, came up. So of course, um, it's a quite a bit challenge. Uh, first of all, it is um, the trails, Chukyak, uh, I think trails data, geospatial data. Um, for them, it's very hard to find it. Um, I, I think they talk with the forest service, anyone from forest service? No? Good. Um, so it's hard to find the ship files. And uh, uh, either they couldn't share it or they couldn't get it. Uh, so um, I think uh, they, they decided to do this as a pilot project. So they collect the trail data by themselves uh, using the GPS and um, build up a database in front of it. Um, and also and then build up a um, mobile apps to update those database and publish to ArcGIS online and so other people can see it. Okay, so that is why the entire workflow and um, the question here is, you know, as you see on this slide, in terms of the database, so they have to decide what is the geometry of the geospatial data, so this kind of a detailed and uh, actually the professionals in the industry actually help them uh, in making those uh, decisions. And also as a faculty, we also help them. But I would say the um, you know, pr industry inputs are very useful. So uh, that's why I think um, those capstone projects are really benefit uh, from your input, from the involvement from the uh, professionals. Uh, you are very, very uh, encouraged to kind of involved with the uh, student in the project. Um, it, you may not see it very uh, uh, clear from this graph here, um, but basically this is the publication, uh, you know, component of um, the project. So uh, they have the database built it up, and then using that database, so collect with um, the um, ArcGIS Online using the feature service, so that the, the users using the mobile can update those uh, trails uh, in the attribute and also when they update it, those updated information can be embedded into the database and published online to the other users. Uh, so that is uh, basically what this graph is talking about. And then down here, the content are uh, the content on the ArcGIS online, uh, what they put there for the feature service. Um, so this is the, actually the website. Um, if you uh, want to check um, their um, you know, published website, ArcGIS Online, and you can go to this website. And the, one of the, you know, as a user, not a contributor, uh, you can kind of, um, you know, using this to search. Uh, for instance, you can search based on um, the status of the trails or the date uh, you want to search for that area of the trails. Uh, you can do that capabilities. Also, you can, uh, using this here, you can look at all those, uh, you know, uh, contributed input from the users, uh, starting from the given date to the end of the date. Uh, so those are all developed by our students. So it's amazing that they customize the ArcGIS Online 
and then to uh, make it um, you know, adapted to what they really want to serve our uh, community. So another very, uh, I think, a very good part or interesting part in this project is this um, uh, app. So it's an Android app. So it's still available uh, in the uh, Android uh, store if you want to download it. Uh, so it's there uh, free, and uh, you are encouraged to download to play with it. Uh, so if you downloaded um, the The first interface you will see is the first page. Uh, so that is uh, actually this portion here. Uh, so before you go out, uh, once you have this app installed, so before you go out, you can actually set up some of the settings for uh, the data. So you can download the map ahead of the time. Uh, in like in Alaska, we don't have internet collection. So you can download the portion you want it, and then that's gonna save on your mobile. And then if you, when you go to the field, and if you see the uh, you know, status on the trail, and you want to share that information, you want to update that information, and at that location, you can open this app, okay? And then you can click on the uh, new entry forms, and you can, it will pop up this window. It will allow you to choose what's the terrain surface, and also, um, I think additional information is, is the trail has the um, obstructions on the road. Uh, do you want to add the descriptions to the trail? So those are some of the things um, the student kind of uh, think about it as a pilot project. And you can add it more uh, you know, regarding the attribute of the trails you want added. Uh, so those are some of the uh, information you can add it. So once you update that and you can uh, click on this one and it's going to record the current locations, for instance, uh, if you are at this trail here and it will record those attributes and um, once you click on record, it's going to show do you really want to update or record those data attributes at this location. Uh, so if you click yes, so it's gonna save under your computer. If you have internet collections during that time, you can submit. So that information, that attribute, will submit it to the ArcGIS Online and update the attribute at that location so other users can see right away. Okay, so this is the, um, um, this is the last part. Do you want to add some descriptions? Um, so this project actually, um, one student is from, Shine is from the um, developer, geo developer uh, concentration in our Bachelor of the Science. Uh, he actually, starting from the, um, using the, I think, um, ArcGIS SDK, um, so for Android developer. So he kind of built that apps based on that. So this is actually quite a bit amazing uh, project, um, our senior project, only four, five months, one semester. So it's really a, a very impressive one. And uh, actually he um, got a good uh, good job, and I think uh, in terms of those uh, projects and then what he learned from our programs. Um, I think I'm a little over time now. Can I, five minutes? Okay. So um, this is the uh, second project I want to introduce here, and this is actually demonstrate a very good uh, collaboration between our uh, senior project and the industry, uh, which is the um, Heritage Land Bank uh, from the Muni. And actually, um, Terry uh, helped us to get the collection with uh, uh, Nicole uh, from the HLB, um, at the Muni, and we, she actually started the discussion. You guys should talk because you want this um, project, and then they have the students who are looking for capstone project. Why don't you guys just talk? And then that's why we talked, and we started. Um, I think uh, the fall semester because our senior project always in the spring. So we talk about it, and we formed the project objectives. Um, what do you need from this project? Uh, so basically they have their um, Heritage Land Bank uh, 2016 annual work programs and also five-year management programs, which are all in the book. 
So if you click on this PDF, and it is actually about um, maybe more than 100 pages, and all of those information, the data, the tables, attributes are all in those books. And they want to share this to uh, ArcGIS Online, but they have no kind of a, um, foundation to start with. So that's why I think we, our students get involved and then, um, so I'm just thinking about that. Uh, so we talk about it. So that's why I think we build up this for them. Well, this is just the interface. What's behind it is actually the hard work. So we convert um, those attributes into uh, the, our, the geo database, and then we actually use the statistics, the uh, spatial analysis, to get what they wanted because they have their um, the, the um, heritage uh, data and not organized in the region, so they want to query based on the region, and also they have the attributes which are in table, so we convert it into the geo database so we can query it. Uh, so that's, um, you know, kind of, uh, we put them together into this entire um, digital format and a sharing platforms. So um, I think we're all of the time to demonstrate it, um, but it's a great uh, way to organize for them, and then they are very happy with it. And uh, I encourage you to go to those links and to check out our project and then, you know, see if you can, uh, you know, have some ideas that we can talk about it. I think that's pretty much I want to talk here. And front with that, I would like to, um, you know, thank our students, uh, help me to put those slides together and also the, their hard work, uh, great work here. Uh, so with that, um, thank you so much. Um, I'd be happy to take some questions if you have. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um track no uh, I think uh, we are uh, we can use a UAV uh, UAS to kind of monitoring a region of the assignment status um, but if you're talking about tracking so you're talking about uh, satellite images um, yes I think that's a great idea to start. Um, I think in terms of the details we can talk about later, but ways that, for instance, we can, you know, have those collected by the sensors which are on site and then see what are those data looks like and what's your um, outcome you would like to kind of talk more in terms of that, you know, development. Here. Yes. <laughs> 